Let's switch. As you can see, I've accumulated an additional whiteboard since our last stream. Um, my plan is to fill this entire space with whiteboards. We're just going to, I think, a third one here, maybe a fourth one across, maybe a fifth one overlaid, and then like a pull down screen. Uh, that'll give me enough board space to keep working. Uh, but realistically, I think eventually I'll consolidate it all to one board. I just, you know, took five minutes to put this up. But this is going to be cool because here I can write what we're talking about today. So I'm Dennis the Professor, uh, as you probably already know, since that's the name of the channel. Uh, and this is our second class together. And we're going to talk about why study money and banking. Uh, money and banking is the class that I currently teach at Queens College uh, and the one I'd like to be covering. Um, the different terminology and institutions involved in this subject. So this is something that's important to gloss over just to get a general understanding so that everyone is on the same page. Uh, and then I have number three, which is a special announcement. Number D, because uh, my wife told me I can't write four for life. So number D is special announcement number two. And then we'll do a quick Q&A session towards the end. So let's begin on why study money and banking. So money affects everyone and everything you do, right? Money equals pervasive is perhaps the word, right? I'm not actually sure if that's the right word. I'm not an English major, but it touches everything. It touches your mortgage. It touches your income. It touches your ability to have financial freedom, your debt. Um, it affects how a lot of people feel, how they perceive themselves. Uh, it topples governments and makes countries extremely powerful. Uh, I mean, there's a reason we use things like sanctions uh, over war a lot of the time because the economic damage that can be done to a country with something like sanctions is actually much greater than, than often we expect. Um, and so obviously having a financial system that is fluid, a financial system, that is fluid and well-functioning can make a big difference, right? So a financial system that's fluid and well-functioning makes sure that money is allocated correctly, right? Or at least to the best of its ability. You know, we've touched in the last lesson on kind of social good and economic good and what's good and what's bad, but the reality is in, in an agnostic system, our financial system works really well, right? If you withdraw judgment from the situation, it's actually pretty good. Uh, but we'll talk about the different things that can be done to improve on this. Um, so my aim in, in teaching this class, and this is something that I've covered before, isn't only so that you understand financial institutions, right? Because inevitably, you'll end up dealing with financial institutions. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to bet that most of you deal with at least a few probably credit card companies, probably banks, um, PayPal, uh, even something like Patreon, right? Those are all financial institutions, right? Um, I was actually going to write financial institutions again as the definition of financial institutions. But what I'll say instead is that not only should you learn about the financial institutions and the different instruments that exists. So if you plan on buying a home, you'll likely need a mortgage. Um, if you plan on starting a business, you'll likely need a loan. So it's important to see all of those different instruments. Um, and finally, we're going to learn most importantly, how to use them to your advantage, right? And this is important because it's no, it's no secret that many of these institutions will try to take advantage of you, right? So, you know, that's, that's kind of the general trend of where things have been going for a long time. Perhaps we're at a point where that's going to change, but in reality, the amount of financial tools and instruments available to you today is growing very, very quickly, right? So if you look at something like Robinhood, right? Robinhood is an investment app on your phone where you can buy and sell stocks 
without needing a brokerage account and entirely without paying fees, right? So this is actually pretty revolutionary considering that, you know, just a few years ago, you needed to be pretty financially well off to be able to afford to invest in things like stocks and bonds and derivatives because the transaction fees were so high, you'd have to go ahead and invest a large chunk of money to erode the percentage of the transaction fees affected. So for example, if you were going to buy $10 worth of stocks, or even $100 worth of stocks, right? If you had to pay a $6 fee on top of that, right? Your stock would need to increase by 6% for you to just break even. And a lot of the times you'd be charged another $6 fee to sell it. And that's pretty ridiculous. I mean, we're looking at a, at a possible 12% increase just to break even, right? Obviously, this gets a lot better when you're buying, you know, $100,000 worth of stocks, right? But not everyone has $100,000 $100, to invest. So, the way money is moved around is through financial markets. All of the financial institutions are active participants and some of the largest in financial markets. So uh, financial markets try to push money to the highest economic utility. Right? And although this sounds, and that's misspelled, but although this sounds difficult um, or, or, you know, particularly economic utility or particularly hard to gauge, Really, the money is going where it can earn the highest interest. Earn the highest interest. Right? Because if money is just sitting still, that's not good for an economy. It's not good for people. Because the reality is, if you have extra income coming in and you're putting it away somewhere, you want it to be earning you some interest. And someone else doesn't have the stash of income or needs a loan or needs some investment capital to build a new factory or create more jobs or whatever it is that they're doing. And they're going to take that money. Hopefully they're going to earn more on it than they're paying you, right? So that everything is stable. And we'll talk about why that instability takes over sometimes. But the basic premise is that money is moved from people that have it to people that can use it most effectively. And then it's paid back to the people that have it in the first place. Now, you know, we can discuss uh, in a later class all of the economic inequality that that creates. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of the economic inequality that's non-systematic, right? So there's quite a big piece that's systematic and we'll talk about why that happens and how that's likely to change in the future. But a lot of the income inequality that happens is due to a lack of financial education, right? Um, simply put, some people have been wealthy for several generations, right? Or have had a relatively high income for several generations. So they have the accumulated knowledge necessary to go ahead and start leveraging these financial instruments. Whereas people with a first time income and first time savings often don't. And because they don't, they're not able to participate in the amazing growth that financial instruments and investments allow them to have for their money. So that's, that's a basic thing and we'll end up covering that in a lot more detail. Um, there's a couple of terms that are really important to know. So, You'll often hear something called financial securities, right? Most often this will be referring to stocks, but in reality, it doesn't have to be, right? One of the other things that it could be referring to is bonds and even certain loans, right? And the only thing a financial security needs to be is a claim on the future income or future asset. So claim on future income or asset, 
right? And in simple terms, what that means is some company or some person is borrowing money and in return saying that you have a claim on some income or asset for lending it to them. For example, when a bank lends you money for a mortgage, the bank has a claim on the asset until you've paid off the mortgage, and that asset is your home, right? So if you're unable to meet those expectations and those terms, you're going to lose your home, basically, right? When a company borrows money, or when they issue a stock, what they're saying is any dollar, right? So let's say they've divided it into 100 stocks, right? And they've sold you one of them. So for every dollar that they earn, one cent will belong to you, right? And this is a really powerful concept because, I mean, if you buy things like ketchup by Heinz, right? And, you know, I think, I think it's not really a huge argument whether or not that's the best ketchup, right? I mean, there's probably good ketchups out there, but it's certainly the best selling, right? If you buy that regularly, why wouldn't you invest in the company that manufactures it, right? Because you could claim a piece of that profit for yourself, right? A piece of their success. And that's a hugely powerful concept. So that's what a financial security is. Moving on from there, there are also bonds. Now bonds fall under financial securities, but bonds are loans made to corporations, made to companies. Now, usually these loans will have some collateral attached to them, meaning that if the loan is not repaid, you will make some money back, and they will have interest attached to them. So if the loan is issued at the end of the term, so let's say a company issues a loan for $100, right? They'd like to receive $100. They are going to pay for the duration of the loan Usually quarterly, but for this example, let's say annually, let's say we have four years, they're going to pay interest. For example, they're going to pay $2 of interest, then they're going to pay $2 of interest. Finally, they'll pay another $2 of interest, now paying back $6 of the 100. And then in the last term, they'll pay back the 100 and another $2 of interest. Right? So if you have funds to tie up, this is a great way to do it. Now, one of the ways that interest is determined is by perceived risk. Perceived risk, right? So a company like Apple has relatively low perceived risk, right? They have a lot of people in their ecosystem. They're working very hard to produce new products and, and you know, making a mess out of headphones, but low perceived risk. So they're able to borrow at a very low rate, especially since they're sitting on so much cash. And as we'll find out, Cash is king. In all situations in finance, cash is absolutely king. However, if you keep too much money in cash, that's not really smart. If you've got no way to spend it or make more money out of it, usually the best way is to invest it somewhere else. So we'll figure out and we'll go through the process of determining an interest rate and how exactly to calculate what you're going to get back. But the important thing to understand is that nothing is for free. right? Nobody borrows money for free. And, well, I just lose my eraser. It did. Where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Sorry about that. So, here's the eraser. Um, cash is king, risk. Right. So, this brings us to an important concept in finance. And the important concept in finance is the time value of money. Time value of money. So the time value of money is, is kind of a fundamental concept. So let me see if there are any questions or anything up until now. Okay, no questions yet. Okay, good. So in finance, the basic concept is the time value of money. And this idea stems from the fact that if I borrowed a dollar from you today and I gave it back to you in 10 minutes, 
you probably didn't have many opportunities to spend that dollar, right? So if I give you back a single dollar, things aren't all that bad, right? Now, if I borrowed a dollar from you today, and then I gave it back to you in one year, you may have had many opportunities to spend that dollar. As a matter of fact, the opportunities you've had to spend that dollar may have even been, let me stand on this side, may have even given you the chance to make more money, right? So perhaps you could have invested that dollar somewhere else and made a dollar and 10 cents. So when I ask you to borrow a dollar, you're going to say, hey, you know, I've got this opportunity to make a dollar and 10 cents. If you make me a better offer, then I'll lend it to you. And this time value of money thing is, is actually really important because fundamentally, even if you don't have an investment opportunity, you have to, have to, have to consider inflation, right? Inflation is a powerful force because if you could buy a loaf of bread 30 years ago for a nickel, and I don't know that that's the actual price, but something leads me to believe that that's relatively close. Um, or maybe not 30 years ago, maybe longer. But the point is, once upon a time, you could buy it for a nickel, and today it costs you $3. If you lent me that nickel, and then I gave you back a nickel, you'd feel pretty ripped off, because now you can't buy anything. Right? So this fundamental concept of time value of money means that fundamentally, a dollar, one dollar, is worth more today, more today, than tomorrow. And this is going to be why whenever money is lent or moved around from one group to another, there's going to be interest, right? The way we account for this is interest. That's what we charge. Now, I'd actually love to cover uh, a topic that I'm not, I'm not deeply versed in but I think it's one that's very important to cover, and that's Islamic finance. Now, as you can imagine, there's actually quite a few religions that consider interest usury, right? Um, and Islamic finance has structured in a way where there's no interest. Uh, they've done away with that concept of interest, uh, and they've done away with it in a couple of different ways. So we'll work through that, uh, possibly in a different lesson, but it's certainly something to consider, right? Nothing is set in stone. The time value of money is a convenient understanding, but it's not the be all end all, right? What I mean is, if you had no investment opportunity and there was no inflation, then time value of money goes right out the window, right? Because you could spend a dollar today, but if you didn't spend it, nothing would happen. And tomorrow, if you got it back, you'd still feel happy, right? So that's time value of money. And this is a, a very fundamental concept for what we're doing. So I'm actually going to, well, I'm actually going to just quickly take a glance at the chat and see if anybody has any questions just specifically to the time value of money. I know it was said that it's nice if I take short breaks and, and just go over stuff. So, um, Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Looks like there's a question about integrals. And change over time, which is, that's the right answer, basically. Very good. Um, okay, so back to the lesson. So time value of money. Now this, this lesson is going to be, uh, like I said before, it's going to be relatively uh, dry or surface level. It's going to be a surface level lesson because we need to be familiar with all of these concepts if we're going to be using them rather rather often. And I'll often go back to them and, and go over them. So one thing that you've probably heard on the news is bear and bull markets, right? So, you know, if the markets are going down, it's considered a bear market or full of bears. And if the market is going up, it's considered a bull market. Now there's some, economic definition for how many weeks certain things have to be happening for this to be true. Uh, but, and, and we're not going to go into that because that's, that's, I mean, fundamentally not a really important distinction. 
Um, what we are going to go into is actually why they're called bear and bull markets. So a bear market is specifically that because when bears attack, and I, I can't draw, so, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I can't draw a bear. But if you can imagine a bear, bears attack down, right? When, they, when, they're, when they're trying to eat you, they attack down. Whereas bulls will charge and attack up, right? So that's a great way to remember what a bear market is and a bull market is. And that is my best imitation of a bear and a bull. And I will never be doing it again. So that's that. If you saw it, you saw it. And uh, now you know. Next, financial institutions. Okay, so this one, this one is a bit big, right? Because it's not, there's not just banks. Uh, although recent deregulation may make it so that it's mostly banks. Uh, but there's not just banks. There's actually quite a few different financial institutions. Uh, the first, of course, like I said, is banks. Right? So banks, traditionally, traditionally, banks will take an income from you, any savings that you have or anything like that, and they will lend it out to people that need it. Right? So people that want to start a company or pay off their debts or do whatever or expand their company or hire more employees uh, will borrow that money from the bank and work through it, right? And they'll earn some interest and give some back to you. Traditionally, this is the business model for banks, right? Interest earned for you and for the bank. Now, the reason banks are able to do this better than me and you is, is quite simple, really. So if anyone came up to me and said, hey, I'd like to borrow $10,000 uh, because I want to start a company, even if I have $10,000, I'd have to go hire a lawyer to draft up a contract, right? Now, that's going to cost me something, so I have to pass on that cost. So all of a sudden, I have to charge more interest to even break even, right? Um, banks, however, can minimize transaction costs, right? So minimize transaction costs. And this is an important distinction because it allows, sorry about that, because it allows for banks to lend on a relatively large scale and very quickly to small, smaller groups of people or smaller amounts. The second thing is research, right? I'm going to be completely honest with you. I love pizza, but I have no idea how to run a pizza shop. No clue. I have no clue if you need more bread or more money to hire employees or 25 chairs or 33 chairs or if it matters if you have booths or not or what kind of soda you're selling. I have no idea. Banks, however, because they lend to so many pizzerias, don't even need to know. What they can estimate is the risk and the risk of failure, right? So pizzerias in this case are actually a pretty bad example because the failure rate for new restaurants is something like 90% in the first three years, right? First three years. And so they're not great to lend money to, right? Unless you've got a reputation and you've got skills doing it, and then they'll, they'll make amends for that. Uh, but then usually if you already have a reputation for opening restaurants, you probably have enough money to go open a restaurant, um, or at least enough money to put up as collateral. So... Banks will evaluate this research and research that you individually would take a very long time to do. Right? So the second type of company in financial institutions is insurance companies. Now, I'm sure all of you have dealt with insurance in one form or another. If you drive, uh, it's in the United States, it's compulsory. Right? So often compulsory. I mean, home insurance is compulsory, right? Um, social security is compulsory in the United States, but the reality is insurance tends to be very good for a society because it means that if your house burns down, you don't just become homeless and your neighborhood gets really bad because now you're just a homeless guy living on the street in front of your old house. Uh, you have something to fall back on. And the same thing happens for cars. I mean, the reality, the most of the reason that you have insurance on your car is because if you hit some other car, um, you're going to need to pay for it, right? And they're going to need to know that they can get the money somewhere. And they know they can get the money from an insurance company. Now, uh, health insurance is, is a topic that we'll discuss in more detail, hopefully, in a later class. And 
um, I've actually done a very detailed financial analysis of health insurance costs in the past. So there's something that I can draw on there and work with. But what you need to know for now is that insurance companies, they take in premiums, right? So they charge you some amount of money every month for having insurance, every six months, whatever, however it is you choose to pay. They take in premiums, and what they do with that money is they invest it. And using statistics, and, and in particular actuaries will do this, they can estimate from a big pool of people by gathering all that risk together, they can estimate what's going to happen to you likely in life, right? And, you know, that, that means that the average person might die, you know, at an age of 80-something, right? And they can expect that that happens, and they can expect to pay out $100,000 when it does. Now, there are going to be outliers. There are going to be people that get sick very young or get sick very old, and end up living a very long time, but they invested to hit the average, right? And as an institution, they have a unique advantage in doing this because they can pool so many people together. So you in particular might not know where you're going to fall on this spectrum of life and when you're going to need insurance, but an insurance company knows that there's a bell curve, there's a bell curve, and that they need to prepare for the most likely scenarios. And that these scenarios will iron themselves out. They'll balance themselves out most of the time. Uh, we'll talk about what pitfalls have happened in the past and uh, how this has been wrong, but the reality is that's simply what insurance companies do, and it's, it's the basics of insurance. Um, next. Oh, gotta be careful with this eraser. Uh, next. So insurance companies, after that, we'll talk about mutual funds. Mutual funds are a recent invention, um, and they work in a very interesting way. So if you wanted to invest in the stock market, let's say you're just like gung-ho about the future of Tesla. So you want to put your money into Tesla, um, you know, and, and maybe that opinion has changed more recently. <laughs> Uh, due to the news, but let's say you want to put your money in Tesla. Um, you really believe that Elon Musk is going to be buying it at $400 a share and so on and so forth, and you want to make a big amount of money. The reality is, if Elon Musk's totally nuts and just loses it tomorrow due to the sleep deprivation and whatever else he deals with running three companies, you might lose your entire investment. So this isn't really smart, right? What you want to do is you want to diversify. So you want to have some money in different sectors. You want to have money in the auto industry. You want to have money in the energy sector. You want to have money um, in the real estate investment trusts. You want to have money all over the economy so that you're growing at a general pace. And, and traditionally what's been shown is that you know, the growth of the S&P 500, which is uh, a major index, is actually better than the growth of investors that pick individual stocks. Uh, but your ability to diversify is limited by how much capital you have, right? So you can't just go, I mean, you can just go out and buy a bunch of shares of different companies. Um, but the reality is, one, you'd need a lot of capital. And two, those shares would have to be available. So some companies don't trade as frequently as something like Apple or Tesla. So their shares may only come up for sale in large blocks and very rarely, right? So what a mutual fund does is it does the diversification for you. It does the diversification. So they pool their money. They agree to a set of rules that they're going to follow. So they're going to invest in every sector, no more than 15% in a sector, and so on and so forth. And once they've set all that up, they take the whole pie, and they divide it up again into shares. And they allow you as an investor to buy a share in this new pie that they've created. Right? So... Most pension funds, 401ks, um, insurance companies are deeply invested in this because they don't need the financial expertise to go out and do this on their own. They simply use the mutual funds to do it for them. So that's mutual funds. So after mutual funds, we have 
investment banks investment banks hedge funds venture capital and what has become known as fintech and we're going to quickly cover these because, one, there's way more depth than is necessary available. And two, these, these financial institutions make a lot more sense in context. So I'd like to cover them more in context. Um, first off, investment banks take companies and bring them to market through a process called an IPO, which is an initial public offering, right, IPO. So an initial public offering allows a company to sell stock or shares, pieces of their company, off to the public and raise funds. Now, importantly, if that stock price goes up a week later, the company doesn't get any more money. They just get that. They can choose to issue stock again in the future, and in that case, they will make more money. But right now, it's simply the immediate payoff, right? Hedge funds are investment institutions, right? They, they just invest. That's it. They're the least restricted form of financial institution. They can get involved in just about any deal. They get involved in hostile takeovers. As a matter of fact, in the last century, most of the colorful stories in finance have come out of hedge funds because of their unrestricted access to the financial system. Venture capital, as you've probably heard, handles investments for startups. Right? So startups are, are all the rage, but it, you know, if you really think about it, Every company was at one point a startup. Um, that's just the case because no one started with an established company yet. So every company is a startup. Venture capital takes on the risk by pooling their money and investing into many startups in an industry where they have special knowledge. So banks think this is too risky. It's too risky. But venture capital believes and is often right that if you invest in 100 companies and only one of them is worth so much more, you have a great opportunity. And finally, FinTech. And FinTech is just anything that allows you to participate in finance more quickly. So PayPal, right? Robinhood, uh, there's a new app that I don't remember the name of that allows you to buy a fraction of shares or automatically invest parts of your income as it comes in. Um, but those are available to you and those are going to keep growing. They're going to change the landscape um, and hopefully divide up the pie of what big institutions currently do by adding more data, more automation to this process. So we'll cover a lot of fintech companies actually in this class, uh, but for the time being, it's important just to know what they are. So before I move on to the next section, I just want to double check if anybody has any questions. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The, the Bay Area is, is, a, is a weird place. Uh, we'll actually cover derivatives, hopefully. So um, I would love to cover that in the future. Uh, that's something That's something actually that I majored in uh, for my master's. So why do hedge funds have unlimited access to the financial system? Um, okay, so one of the things that actually happens is, and the, you know, this is maybe hard to believe based on the news, but um, finance companies are the most restricted in the United States than they are anywhere else globally, right? Um, so basically what ends up happening is an insurance company is restricted on what it can invest in. And the reason it's restricted is because you have certain expectations from an insurance company. Right? You don't want them gambling for your money. You want them investing for something that's going to pay off in, in a long time horizon that's going to be relatively stable because it adds stability. Now, of course, if you let these people do it on their own, they're not going to take the chance, right? They're just going to invest as aggressively as possible and try to make as much money as possible. So we need regulation to do that. Um, hedge funds, on the other hand, usually only take investors with capital of over 1 million, 
they usually lock it up long term. Right? So if you have capital over $1 million to invest, you're probably not that worried about losses. Right? I mean, you are. You're just as worried as any other person. But it's not you losing your house. Right? It's you losing maybe a small quality of life. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, and I completely spaced, uh, hedge funds take over a million. Oh, it's predominantly tends to be a partnership structure. And what this means is that the majority of the ownership from the income coming from the hedge fund is actually owned by the partners of the hedge fund, right? Usually employees that have worked their way up to the top and now can share in this income, right? So a very famous partnership and a very old one um, that actually no longer is a partnership is Goldman Sachs, right? And Goldman Sachs tends to make the news all the time, but the reality is most of the spoils within Goldman Sachs are shared amongst the partners, right? Very little actually gets distributed to the public. Um, and, you know, a small fraction gets distributed to investors. So the reason they're unrestricted is because the people that are investing in these funds are not at high risk for their capital, right? So if you have home insurance, you're probably worried about losing your home. If you have a million dollars laying around, you're probably not particularly worried, right? You probably have other assets and so on and so forth. It, it's actually, they actually also fall into the realm of accredited investors, right? Which are considered more, more able to take risk and better to understand it. Um, and really, I don't, I don't know if that's entirely true, but what they can do is they can afford to have someone figure out the risk for them, right? To have someone figure it out. And that's why they're allowed more rain. But, like I said, in the United States, we actually have the most restrictions on what financial institutions can do with money. So those are the financial institutions, and I mean there are others, uh, savings and loans, and so on and so forth, and we'll go into them. Um, but those are the major ones that that generally you'll have to consider, and that we'll be talking about in this class. Um, okay, so financial institutions move money around. That's great, right? So we're moving money around, and now we have to start thinking. Okay, so as a country. How do we check the effectiveness of this movement, right? How do we check the effectiveness of this movement? So the first way, and perhaps the most popular way, is we look at something called gross domestic product. Gross domestic product. Right? And gross domestic product is everything. Everything produced in a country and sold, except for two things. The first thing, is things made in the past, right? Made in the past. So if a Rembrandt painting sells for $50 billion in the United States, it doesn't matter. That doesn't affect our GDP because that's already been accounted for once, right? If you could just keep reselling things, that would be a problem. Um, and two is stocks and bonds and generally financial instruments, but we'll stick to stocks and bonds, right? And the reason this is, is because you're participating in the, in the actual system of moving money around. So someone is taking that money and hopefully producing something with it. Um, if they're not producing something with it, that's a problem. So one of the thoughts I actually had when writing this lesson was that this is an interesting incentive for planned and I don't know how to spell this word for the life of me, but you'll understand the word obsolescence. We'll pretend that that's the way to spell it, okay? You guys just have to believe me, right? But, I mean, this basically means that, you know, you, you buy an iPhone, and then, you know, within a year, it's just not, it's just not doing anything anymore. It's, just, it's been updated to hell. All the, all the hardware sucks. It just sucks. It's just meant to break down, right? Um, I heard a great story about somebody that had a washing machine. Uh, called up the company and they were like, hey, you know, it's been six months and it broke down. And they were like, oh, yeah, these usually break down in about six months. Right? So if this is great for GDP, right, because you go out and you buy more labor to fix it. You buy more washing machines. You buy more 
river, yeah, it's really not great for consumers. Um, and so this is one of the things that you're going to have to learn to think about abstractly in terms of what is, some, what is the method or the way that we measure something, how does that affect the way we plan our policy and the way we work through things. Right, so this is this is really something to consider. A gross domestic product is generally measured me measured on a nation to nation basis, and in general, we want gross domestic product increasing because that means things are getting better. Right, um, it's important to consider this number in two ways. Right, first, there's nominal and real GDP. Right, nominal and real GDP. Right? So, one of the ways. So if you, if you imagine this system and you were trying to make your gross domestic product as high as possible, the quickest way to do it is just print more money, right? So if a loaf of bread cost a dollar yesterday and it cost $500 today, suddenly you sell one loaf of bread and your GDP is 500 times as high. Um, that's what real GDP adjusts for. Real GDP is less inflation, right? Now, the way we track inflation is with CPI. CPI is a consumer price index, right? And uh, generally what we do is we take a basket, and I'm going to draw a terrible basket. That's an acorn, your basket, right? We take a basket of goods, a washing machine, maybe some rugs, some food, uh, a car, some gas, right? We take that basket of things that people generally buy, and we say, okay, well, what was it worth last year? Well, last year we could have bought everything for $95. Okay, great. This year, we can only buy it for $97, right? So that means that we've lost $2 to inflation, right? $2 just disappeared because we still need the same basket. Now, we're going to go into this in more detail in a diff different lesson, but CPI has been grossly abused, right? Grossly abused um, by economists and predominantly by the government. Because the government ties a lot of things to CPI. For example, income of government employees, or your retirement funds if you're a government employee, or budgets, and things like that, right? So when you tie things to CPI, you have a very big incentive to only keep goods that are not increasing in, in price too much, right? So we're not putting iPhones in here. That's a fact. There's no way. iPhones are going up in price when technology is improving, right? That doesn't make any sense, so we're not putting that in. Anything that generally is getting better but also costing more is not going to be in that basket, right? Instead, we'll put something like Heinz ketchup because really Heinz ketchup just depends on the price of tomatoes and it's relatively stable, right? So that's what CPI is and we'll talk about why it's abused and how, but importantly, that's how we determine inflation or the amount of money that we've added to the economy without actually using it. The other thing to consider about GDP, I don't remember. Um, so it's adjusted for inflation. Oh, the other thing to consider about GDP, and perhaps an interesting replacement for CPI, are the two things I'm going to touch on. The first is that, well, let's start with the replacement for CPI. So as a replacement for CPI, you can look something up called the hamburger index. Hamburger index. And what this is, is I'm going to have to glue that eraser. Uh, and what this is, is the cost of a hamburger in different countries across the world, right? A McDonald's hamburger. And what this tells you is a relative price level amongst countries. And it's usually very closely related to their GDP. The second thing to consider is per capita GDP. Per capita. Right? And this is important for quality of life. So, for example, if 10 people live in your country and your gross domestic product is 1,000 people, that leaves $100 per person. Right? That's a pretty good deal. Now, let's say we were just looking at GDP, even inflation-adjusted GDP, and our GDP the next year was 1500 Looks like we had 50% 50, 50 growth. I mean, that's that's a little absurd, but we had 50% growth, right? Uh, excuse me. This is this is dollars. Um, we had 50% growth, but let's say we actually have 30 people now. 
that's problematic because it means the general standard of living has gone down by 50%. And this is an important thing to keep an eye on. Right? This is a very important thing to keep an eye on because what's important isn't how much a country is making. It's how much the individuals in that country have divided amongst them. And we can talk about how that number is even more skewed when you consider how much wealth is concentrated. And we'll talk about the concentration of wealth. It's actually a topic I'm sure a lot of you are very passionate about and interested in because, let's be honest, most of you are not in that group where the concentration of wealth is, right? And for as long as that is the case, that we are going to have people interested in creating greater equality. And I think that is to the benefit of the financial system. Um, we'll talk about various methods historically that have been used, uh, and, and we'll talk about various methods that we might see in the future, like basic income and the economic impact of those things. So now that I've covered GDP, I'm going to take another minute, sit down, let you guys ask any questions. Yeah, I don't like the eraser either. It's son of a bitch eraser. So if you guys have any questions, I'm going to spend about a minute here. Um, yeah. Okay. Doesn't look like there are any questions at this time. So I'll take a second. I'm going to try to come up with a better system for that because I'd rather, you know, uh, I was actually speaking to someone. Oh, question. Are there any metrics commonly used to measure the quality of life in people? Um, hmm. That's a good question. I don't actually, I don't have an answer to that question. The quality of life. So how would we d determine the quality of life? Um, you know, because we could put something like this together, right? So that's probably like access to education, right? Um, access to social mobility, access to stuff like that. I'm sure there is a metric, but the thing is, once again, it, it's going to very much depend on your quality of, on your quality of life, excuse me, on your measurement, like, you know, is, is the ability to never work for a day because I have social income a high quality of life? Or is a high quality of life the freedom to pursue whatever venture I feel like pursuing, right? Like, you know, um, America's pretty far down, right? And, and I speak from an American context, but America's pretty far down in education, for example, in public education at least. And hopefully we can make a change there globally, um, but it's pretty far down. But on the other side, it is the third best place in the world to start a business in terms of the complexity and ease, which means ability to get financing, ability to get money to invest in your business, ability to have space, right? So your quality of life really depends on your goals. Um, in general, I think, I think most economists would, would point to the fact that, you know, having more money just equals more quality of life. And, and maybe that's true to a degree. Um, but quality of life is a very finicky subject in terms of how you define it. But if you guys like, one of the lessons we can try to put something together, um, I'll try to write this down later, but one of the lessons we can try to put something together and then measure quality of life. Um, we'll actually just pull up some statistics that are publicly available, and a lot of them are doctored in terms of, uh, you know, outside of most countries that report their data transparently, but we'll... We'll work through that, and I, I would love to actually put something together like that. Um, so that's quality of life, right? Okay, so next section. Okay, one of the things we're going to talk about in this class um, is budget and debt. No, excuse me, budget and trade. Surplus and deficit. Surplus and deficit. I'm not going to go into much detail on this now because we don't have the context to go over it yet. But deficit, not always bad. Surplus, not always good. Okay? Um, if we're running a deficit, that doesn't mean that's the best thing ever. So, for example, imagine if you were living every day, you know, just living your life, and you could borrow... A million dollars at zero percent interest. Now, if 
if you're living in this world, right, there is no reason for you to not run a deficit. There's no downside. There's absolutely no downside. I mean, unless you take the money and burn it, you've got nothing to lose. You're basically getting a free million dollars. And sometimes, especially during economic crises, the government is in a situation where it can basically borrow billions of dollars at no interest because all the other financial assets are so unsafe. And we'll go into government financial assets, but that's a great time to run a deficit because what we're doing is with that deficit, hopefully what the government is doing with that deficit is building roads or general infrastructure, creating jobs, investing in R&D, um, you know, maybe rescuing banks, and we'll talk about that whole situation in 2008 and before that in the savings and loan crisis. Um, but hopefully they're using this money. So this is a fantastic time to run a deficit. Now, on the other hand, if we have no domestic investment whatsoever, so there's just, it's not that there's nothing left to build, it's just that whatever we build is going to basically take our people from earning $10 a year to 10 10 a year, right? It's not a drastic increase, right? They're not going to really notice it. But if we take our money and lend it to another country that has a better use for it, we can do that. And that's actually the China-US relationship at this point, right? So China can lend us money because their marginal improvements are not that huge. And they understand that having more money down the line is going to allow them to do more. So they're lending it to us because we have a great way of doing it. As a matter of fact, the way to think about surplus and deficits and the general macroeconomic situation is very similar to the small scale. Some people have money that they're not using due to high income or savings or whatever it is, and some people need money. And so governments will run surpluses and deficits. Um, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about more what ends up happening to a lot of these countries and uh, how things tend to resolve themselves, or how they have resolved themselves in the past. But the one thing that's very true is, you know, this is something that that is important to understand in finance and economics and in all business in general, right? Nothing is constant. Nothing, nothing is true forever. Except for two things, right? For every rule, there's a way to break the rule. There's two things that are true forever. Right. Or, you know, within the context of capitalism, obviously, I'm not talking about you know, millions of years from now, are one business cycles. Goddamn eraser. Business cycles. So we will certainly be going through business cycles again and again and again and again and again. That's just the nature of business. Um, I'll walk you through actually why a lot of them have happened and, and how we can look at it and think about more. But business cycles are, are a pretty important piece. And productivity growth, right? So if you ever have the time or the interest, you can look up a graph of productivity growth. Uh, and productivity growth has basically looked like this with some ups and downs, growing at an average of 2% per year for about 2,000 years. So... I mean, it might change, but I'm not going to be the guy who says that's going to stop happening. Because I, this has been relatively stable, and, and it's probably going to stay relatively stable. You know, I, I, think, I think trends that happen for 2,000 years they tend to be pretty firm. So we'll go into more on what business cycles are, but that's an important thing to remember in finance, right? It's an important thing to remember in finance because... Everything I tell you is subject to change, and it's subject to change in context from one thing to another. So my goal is to equip you with the tools to think about those contexts and think about when change is coming. Um, okay, so let's take a quick break for questions, and then we'll jump to the next topic. Yes, absolutely. There is there is a rule for which there is not a way to break the rule. That is, that is absolutely it. Uh, 
I would click the link, but I'm going to be honest, I, uh, I don't know what that's going to do to my stream, so I'm just, I'm just going to skip it for now until I learn. Boom, bust, or something else. Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so business cycles. This is actually what I was going to go into next, but business cycles are exactly what you're thinking about. Boom and bust cycles, um, recessions, depressions, moments of growth, whatever you choose to call them, right? We have booms and bust cycles, right? So during booms, everybody's making money, right? Everybody's doing well. Jobs are growing. Everything is getting better, right? And during busts, everything is getting worse very quickly, okay? Worse very quickly. Usually it doesn't take a long time to realize that things have gotten bad, and when they do get bad, it gets really bad. Now, the reason this keeps happening is twofold. Uh, one of them is purely psychological. All right. So the reason is, if you go outside every day and somebody hands you flowers, you're going to start to expect somebody to hand you flowers every single day. And if they're not there one day, you might think, oh, okay, well, I mean, maybe they missed today. And if they're not there another day, you might make another excuse. And, and so... Basically, and we'll go into this in more detail because I don't, I don't have the notes to cover this, but um, basically our expectations are, are slow to change, right? So, you know, if you look at a financial cycle, and it, and it usually looks something like this maybe, right? Um, as things are increasing, more and more people are starting to get involved. More and more people are starting to get interested, right? Um, you can look at it as the price of Bitcoin, although that was mostly price fixing and price fixing later, but um, things are generally getting better. And when things are getting better, people tend to believe and commit as though things are going to keep getting better. Now, that's never the case, of course, and things eventually get worse, but no one knows exactly when they get worse. Um, so what happens is we're basically playing a game of hot potato, right? A company will borrow money to build a factory, right? They'll build a factory. It's a huge success because they're producing something people need, right? over here. Their profits are growing, right? So they're able to borrow more money to build another factory because they figure, well, I mean, it's working, right? We might as well. Their profits are growing again, right? But the bank is charging them more interest. From here to here, we're charging more interest, okay? Finally, the bank charges them interest over here. Suddenly, People are like, ah, oh, you know, I've had a lot of your product, but recently I lost my job, or things are getting tough, or I've been thinking about saving for a house, and I'm not going to buy as much of it. So all of a sudden, the company starts taking a loss on this last factory. They're having trouble repaying the bank. As the bank's funds tend to dry up, they tend to restrict lending even more. As they restrict lending, we start going into a downside. Right? And we have various monetary tools, and we'll, we'll actually cover those in a great amount of detail so that you understand what it is that we can do with them. But until that point, um, we basically keep going as though things are good. Because imagine the contrary, right? Imagine if you were the competitor, right? And as the competitor, you decided that the financial crisis was going to happen right over here. So you stopped investing. Right? All of a sudden, your competitor has overtaken you because they chose to risk it one more time. Right? In the long term, you might win. But as we'll find out in capitalism and predominantly in business in the United States today, we are not driven by a long-term perspective. We are driven by a very short-term perspective. And that brings us to the second reason, and perhaps the most powerful reason that we'll discuss is incentives. Okay? So, the most recent financial crisis emanated from the United States, right? Um, it emanated from the United States, and it emanated particularly from the real estate sector and from bad mortgages. We'll go into a, a, a whole class on what happened because it was such a mess and tangle, and we'll cover actually a few financial crises so that you can understand what's happening. Um, but poor incentives drive bad behavior. 
It's as simple as that. Nobody needs to call up their buddies and say, hey, we're going to screw all these people on mortgages. All they need to say is, we're going to pay you more commission every time you close a mortgage. Right? And all of a sudden, all of these salespeople, not considering in the macro context what they're doing, start giving out more mortgages on lower credit. Okay? Because things start to look like they're going to be good forever. And I, I'm not going to keep touching on those details, but that's the basics of, of business cycles. And we'll go into a lot of detail. But you should know that they are as sure as anything has been in capitalism so far. One more thing to remember, since you are uh, an international audience, is you, Americans tend to have this closed perspective on financial crises, right? And what I mean is, when Americans talk about a financial crisis, they'll say, oh, it was the savings and loan crisis. You know, so these were smaller banks, and they had concentrated risk, right? And, and that's what happened to them, right? But, as I learned very quickly... People in France don't think it was the savings and loan crisis. They think it was an American crisis. Right? It was a crisis in the American financial system that spread and hit everybody. Right? Same thing with the mortgage-backed security. Mortgage-backed security crisis. Right? The people abroad think, well, that's an American crisis. And that's an important thing to consider because I see a lot of people speculating nowadays on well, we're overdue for a financial crisis, it's been over a decade, and so on and so forth. And they're always looking at American sources, and I don't actually think that needs to be true, right? I think something powerful like the breakup of the EU, right? A poor transfer of power in China, um, inflation in real estate prices on global investment properties, right? All of those things could cause a financial crisis. Uh, and so all of those things should be considered. So it's important, and I think it's, it's fitting that we're teaching this class to an international audience and that we're all studying together, because it's important to have a global, oh God, to have a global perspective when you're talking about finance. So, okay, one more minute for questions, and then we'll get on to the next, the next topic. Let me get my glasses on here. What are we learning? Oh, we are learning, okay, class number two, right now we're learning why study money in banking, and more per particularly the terminology and in institutions. Yeah, predominantly, so, so we're basically taking economics and we're saying what we're gonna do with them. Is Bitcoin considered a company? <laughs> Bitcoin is a lifestyle. Yeah, well, to some people it really is. I mean, I've heard some ridiculous things about what people are doing to get more Bitcoin. Um, as in they could get loans from private banks. No, no, there's no, so Bitcoin couldn't get loans from private banks because Bitcoin is a currency. Um, Bitcoin is a currency. So I actually, in the previous lesson, I covered currencies and I think it's a big, it, it is a big topic. Um, but I will have a specific lecture set up for Bitcoin in general. Uh, and I would love, I would love to go into that and go into more about the technology and kind of the impact it's going to have on the financial system. Because I think anybody that thinks that it's not going to have an impact is is way off point. It might not be Bitcoin in particular, but cryptocurrencies and that technology is here to stay. So we'll see. But it is not considered a company. I also I'm going to figure out whatever's going on with the light here. Are all these lessons going to be saved? And if yes, what? Yes. So they will be in the VOD section of the Twitch channel for as long as they're going to be there and I will be uploading them to YouTube and labeling them appropriately. Uh, I'm going to try to make them as searchable as possible, but for the time being, that's the, the simplest solution I've come up with. Hopefully I can come up with something a little more advanced so that you can jump to specific topics or specific conversations. Uh, but for now, I'm going to be uploading them as is straight to YouTube. So. You can find them there, and they're under the same name, Dennis the Professor. I'm amazed that that name was taken. But maybe there's not a lot of Dennis's that are professors. Who knows? So, okay, we've talked about budget surplus and deficits. Financial crises. Ah, so here's, this is a big one. One of the things we're going to cover in a great amount of detail in this class is monetary policy. Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve. 
Now, besides being the center of, of quite a few conspiracy theories, the Federal Reserve actually plays a pretty big role in our economy. Um, as does the central bank. Uh, and as does monetary policy. Actually, they're all very, very, very closely connected. Um, and they're responsible for slightly different things. So, monetary policy has to do with a couple of different issues, right? At first, monetary policy has to do with the money supply. The money supply. So, the easiest way I found to illustrate the money supply is the following, and it's it's perhaps the reason that a, a uh, commodity-based currency didn't work, right? So imagine if you've got a pie of pizza, just awesome-looking, not that great at drawing pizza, but that's pizza, okay? It's got pepperonis on it and stuff. It's very important. This is like, I think this is a pizza that's high enough quality that, that Rob would like it. I think that's important that we, that we go ahead and do that because we don't, I mean, you know, we're in, you know, we're, we're in New York. We don't want to mess up the pizza, okay? So that's a pizza, and you're going to bring over eight friends, okay? So you invite over eight friends, and you order a pizza, right, or seven friends or whatever. There's eight of you in total, and everybody gets a slice, and everybody's happy. Okay, so that's the money supply, all right? Those are the individuals and companies in your economy. Now imagine if all of your friends, just unbeknownst to you, decide to bring a plus one, right? So now you've got 16 friends coming over. Now you've got two choices, okay? The first choice is to divide up this pie of pizza, again, into 16 slices. But you see, the problem is, a couple of people have already eaten their slice. So everyone left over is going to get a much smaller slice of this pizza. Or instead, you could order a second pizza to accommodate for the needs of your friends plus one. And this one will have much fewer pepperonis because the pizzeria will not be happy that they have to make two deliveries within 20 minutes of each other and that you consider tipping not a good thing to do. So, you order the second pizza. And that's what we do with the money supply, right? So, I know that's a bit hard to connect, but I'll try to explain it a slightly different way. If I gave each of you a dollar and you had something to do with that dollar, that's great. But what if one of you wanted to start a new business? You would have to take a dollar from someone else. But the reality is everyone's only got one dollar to spend. So even if you built this business with two dollars, right, and you collected people's dollars, you would have no way but to keep paying them to keep working for you, right? So you'd be in a closed system. So what you need to do is you need to increase the number of dollars at the same pace as the growth of your economy, right? So if the number of things happening is increasing, the number of dollars should relatively closely follow suit, right? So this is dollars, and this is things. And I think the next thing I'm going to do is get colored markers, because it looks like for graphs it will be more useful. But this is dollars, and this is things, and this is an eraser. <laughs> and what we're going to find is that what ends up happening sometimes is the number of things will taper off, but the number of dollars will keep increasing. And that's where we create inflation, and that's not a good thing. And that's actually covered in the previous lesson, which should have been, it, it, whatever. Point is, that's how it looks. So we want it to keep up, because if it doesn't keep up, then things start declining in actual dollar price. And believe it or not, as much as you'd like to see, you know, so if we restricted the money supply, what would happen inevitably is, you know, the current iPhone, which is $1,000, right? which is another sign that inflation is happening, right, um, would eventually go down to $100. See, the issue is, though, if you go to Apple employees and you tell them that they're going to be making one-tenth of what they used to make, they're not going to be very happy. As a matter of fact, they're going to have a lot of trouble hiring people. And, you know, what if Apple doesn't adjust fast enough? 
what if pizzerias adjust first because they're better able to hire college students? All of a sudden, everybody's priced out of apples. So what you get is a contraction in the economy. And that's something that we call deflation. And deflation is a terrible thing. And we'll actually, I think there's actually enough in deflation to, to put together a lesson. Maybe I'll do like a deflation, inflation, and hyperinflation lesson. So that's the money supply. The other thing that we often worry about is the interest rate. Now, the interest rate is actually pretty important because here's the thing. If the interest rate is too high, then companies aren't going to want to borrow money. If companies don't want to borrow money, they don't want to build stuff. If they don't want to build stuff, we start losing jobs. We've got a really bad scenario. That's basically what happened in 2008. This happens when the perceived risk is too high. Perceived risk is high. Or the money supply is too high. So although your savings account may be earning 10% interest, inflation is eating away most of that. And so people aren't really tempted to go build and make stuff if they have to keep increasing prices because they understand that this situation can't last forever. So one of the things that the Federal Reserve does is it controls interest rates. Now, it's important to note that they control interest rates and so they tend to communicate in a veiled way that they will be doing this regularly. Right. So in a veiled way, I mean, not necessarily it's a big secret, but they'll be like, well, we're targeting increasing at a quarter of a percent every quarter. Right. So it'll go up 0.25 to 0.5 to 0.75, and this is relatively predictable. And this actually does something really interesting in the economy. Because if I know that tomorrow the interest rate is going to increase and therefore my borrowing prices will increase, I'm more likely to borrow right now. Right? So if you accelerate this curve too quickly, you'll have too many people borrowing way too early and then defaulting down the line. If you accelerate it too slowly, you have another problem. Right? So if you accelerate this curve super slowly, so it goes from you know, 0 0.05 to 0.10 to 0.15, right? all of a sudden, people are disinterested on when to borrow. Right? So, in general, the Federal Reserve will work to do this. Now, why do we even do monetary policy, right? So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of people out there, um, more in recent, in, in recent history, that have said, well, let the markets do what they do best, right? Or give them market freedom. Now, I mean, you can imagine hopefully why this is a terrible idea because in general people are pretty self-interested um, but market freedom so that's a great concept and a good idea but the fact of the matter is the Great Depression if we had not taken measures to institute things like the FDIC which ensures your deposits at banks and prevents bank runs and so on and so forth exist in order to shorten times of depression, right? So yes, eventually everything will correct itself, right? Um, and I don't remember the economist that said, this is a very famous economist, but he said that yes, eventually it'll correct itself, but eventually we'll also all be dead, right? So it's better to live now and correct things almost brute force then wait forever and just end up dying before it ever happens, right? So that's where government intervention into markets is an extremely important thing to do um, and basically why it happens. And we'll talk about, once again, different scenarios and different contexts, but the important thing to know is that it does happen and that it will keep happening and that it's probably a very good thing. All right, a few more questions while I take a look here at our next topic of choice. Yeah, you guys let me know if you have any questions at this point, and then we'll move on. So there's actually a 
So actually two more two more major topics that we need to cover. Uh, and one of them is actually very short. Why are they veiled interest rates? Well, okay, so I mean if they came out um Oh, well, I actually, okay, so one thing at a time. Um, I've never heard of brain bites, but I'll write that down. So brain bites. I'll write that down and definitely take a look. Thank you very much for that suggestion, Stealth. Um, Apple them. Why are they veiled interest rates? So basically, the Fed wants the opportunity, because none of us know the future, right? So when they're making a prediction that's going one year into the future and they're saying, okay, we'll do it around here and around here and probably around here, they want the freedom to adjust this as they see new data, right? So if they just made this prediction and decided, okay, well, you know, we're going to do this regardless of what's happening, they could very well cause what we talked about earlier, which is they could cause the economy to overheat, right? or they could cause it to grow too slowly, right? Both creating problems. So they want the freedom to be able to adjust, which is why when they communicate to the investment community, they give them a general idea of what they're seeing now and leaving it open so that they can make changes. That's the reason that the interest rates and interest rate changes are generally failed until they're actually announced. Um, yeah, okay. So... The next thing is, is relatively short, so I won't stop for questions, and then we'll go on to the last piece, uh, and then hopefully I'll do all my awesome special announcements, and I can take some more, some more general Q&A as I, as I start up this stream and get things going. So, U.S. government securities. U.S. government securities are considered the most liquid financial instrument in trading, outside of that, you know, cash, but nobody trades cash for cash back and forth, unless you're in foreign exchange and you're trading different currencies. Um, U.S. government securities are fundamentally <sighs> traded at $500 billion of value per day. Okay? That is an enormous, enormous amount of trading, right? It basically dwarfs every other financial instrument by a factor of at least 10, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a huge amount of money. And the reason is that U.S. government securities are considered safe and by some people even risk-free. Now, we'll talk about safe and they are relatively safe i mean there's a good chance the person will pay you back if they can one print money and two happen to be the richest person on the block right um they're pretty safe okay and that's fair i mean you might not get the same value that you put in but you'll get something back risk-free however is something that's not all that guaranteed, right? So as the United States has accumulated more debt, risk has gone up, right? And we've seen other governments default. We've seen individual states default. Um, I think the United States default would be, would be, you know, pretty catastrophic in terms of financial markets, but it could happen. And that's an important thing to remember. The driving force behind all interest rates, the driving force behind all investments, the driving force behind all venture capital, business ventures, anything that happens that is financially related is risk. Risk is absolutely the fundamental piece, right? When we talk about derivatives, we'll talk about actually how to price risk and how to figure it out and how to weed it out of all the pieces. But here, risk is extremely important because someone that's a high risk will be borrowing at a higher percentage because their loss is going to be lower. Someone that's a low risk, right? So high risk equals high percentage. And low risk 
equals low interest. Excuse me, not percentage. Low interest. Right? So when you pay a low interest rate for a high risk, you create some problems. Right? You create some problems because you're borrowing on very shaky ground. Right, and you're hiding the risk, and this is something that happened during mortgage, more, with mortgage-backed securities, predominantly due to a mistake made by rating agencies. And rating agencies are another pillar in our economy um, as a whole, because what rating agencies do is they look at a company. Usually what they'll have is they'll have non-public information. So, for example, when they come in, a company can say, well, you know, for the next quarter, we're actually about to report a 20% growth in sales, but that hasn't come out yet. So they can't trade on it, but they can make their decisions based on that information. Um, they usually have very detailed statistical models. But here's the thing, rating agencies uh, get paid by the companies they rate. Now this isn't all of the money that they make, they make other money from publishing reports and so on and so forth, but fundamentally, and this used to be even worse, right? So somebody that used to come in and say, okay, well I'm going to give your company a rating and I'm going to say it's from somewhere between A and D, for example, right? And there's different rating systems. And we, you know, we might touch on that, but it's less important. Um, from A to D, and if, you, if I rate you at A, you can borrow at 1%. And if I rate you at D, you can borrow at 10%, right? And then companies used to be able to come up to the person giving them this rating and say, hey, I'm really glad that you gave us a C today. I'd actually like to send you on a vacation to the Bahamas as a great thank you. Right? And of course, when you come back next quarter and they send you on vacation again, I mean, you know, you're coming home and you're like, well, I'm family, we're going to go to Hawaii. Yay, that's awesome. If you come in and you have to give them a lower rating, you're going to consider whether or not you want to go on vacation that year. And so you tend to inflate ratings. Um, this has been done away with. They're actually not even allowed to accept a box of chocolates now. However, we'll talk about separation and cross-contamination between financial institutions and, and how that can be truly disastrous for the things that we do. Because at the end of the day, these people are going to do whatever they can to get ahead. Just like everyone else does in anything that they do, they try to work hard. Uh, you know, and, and it's easy to discount morality when everyone else around you is as well. So the last thing I'd like to cover is directly associated with risk. And there are three terms that are very important to know, right? The first is asymmetric information. Asymmetric information, right? So asymmetric information is the following. We do not have the same understanding of what's actually, what's actually going to happen if you lend me money. So for example, if I go to a bank and I say, I'd like to open a pizza shop, and really I just have a bad gambling problem, they don't know. They don't know. They can check and they can do a lot of due diligence, but the reality is they really don't know. Right? As a matter of fact, if I come up to you and I say, well, I'm an extremely successful businessman and a billionaire. And I say, would you lend me $10,000? I mean, you're probably not going to try to take my word for it. You're going to try to check. But if you do take my word, that's asymmetric information, right? So financial institutions, excuse me, financial institutions try to prevent you from taking advantage of asymmetric information. Regulators try to prevent financial institutions from taking advantage of asymmetric information. And so we've got this whole big soup, but the reality is that's just the world that we live in. If information is naturally asymmetric. One of us knows more of one thing, another of us knows more of another, but I believe that financial education helps reduce asymmetric information, which is why what we're doing here and what we're trying to put together is so important. 
The second thing is adverse selection. Now, adverse selection is actually pretty interesting. Let's say that you have two aunts. Okay, so just two aunts. And one aunt uh, just doesn't know how to manage her money, always is spending on frivolous things and then just not having enough for bills and stuff like that. And the other aunt is very good at managing her money. Okay? Which one of those do you think is more likely to come to you for a loan? The reality is, it's the aunt that can't manage her money. And that's adverse selection. So this is the risk that takes place, risk before a transaction. Someone that is liable to misuse your trust, your loan, your money, whatever it is that you're giving them, is actually more likely to ask you for it, right? The second piece of that puzzle is moral hazard. And moral hazard is after a transaction. So it's risk after a transaction. I'll give you a great example, okay? Let's say that you, you that you currently own a beat up old car with very very cheap insurance, right? So you're not I mean, if something happens, you're probably going to be on the hook for most of the money. You're going to drive very safely because you don't want to pay a bunch of money. But let's say you buy a new car and you're required to have full coverage insurance. No matter what happens, the insurance company pays, but it's very expensive, but you're required to have it by law. How are you gonna drive? You may actually, and it's been shown, drive worse after you've gotten the insurance because you have less to lose now. And that's moral hazard. So this is risk after a transaction. Now insurance companies will try to deter that kind of behavior with different incentives and so on and so forth, but the reality is, once something is already in your hand, or covered, or safe, you're more likely to take big risks with it, right? And that's very important. So that's moral hazard, right? Um, in general, and I'll reiterate this from the beginning of the class, as we wrap up here and as I stop for questions, is we're going to be learning all this. And a lot of this is um, relatively broad, nonspecific, um, you know, you have to use your imagination a lot to, to kind of piece together all these things. But they're going to affect every single one of you directly throughout your life for the rest of your life. There's no getting away with it. I don't care if you're extremely rich. I don't care if you're extremely poor. The financial system will affect you no matter what you do. And that's an important thing to remember because it's going to matter. And that's why we're learning this. We're learning this not only so that you understand what's happening in the financial system, but so that you can take advantage of it to your benefit, to your benefit specifically, and so that you can avoid it taking advantage of you, right? So that's why we're learning this. Okay, so I'm going to stop for one minute just to just to answer questions on what I just covered, and then I'll, I'll go to the special announcements. So we'll leave the big Q&A for after special announcements, because I'm sure I'm sure you guys will have more questions. So just on just what I covered, are there any questions? Oh hey, I'm I'm really happy, man. Oh green, holy moly! I can't I can't really see the colors all that well yet, because I think I have it in dark mode. I gotta, you know, mess around with all this stuff. But I'm I'm really glad you enjoy it. I'm I'm really happy about that. I really you know, I try to put uh, my soul into the teaching as much as I can, um, and I, I love this topic. This is something that I've learned for a long time. Um, so you know, I hope you stick around, and I hope you. Uh, you get something out of it that's interesting. Um, and I'm always open to feedback. So there's always ways I can improve. I know, I know, you know, professors tend to be a little bit like set in their ways or whatever, but I, I really want to just get better at this and get better at delivering this information to you guys. So, okay. It doesn't,